I think a way of thinking about what has happened to debt in the global economy since 2007, 2008, is that after an enormous build-up of private sector credit to GDP, private sector debt in the advanced economies, in several of the advanced economies, that debt has not gone away. It's simply shifted around the world economy. It's gone a little bit. There's been some private sector deleveraging in the US, UK, France, other advanced economies, Spain, uh, but their public debt has gone up. There's been deleveraging in total in Germany, but Chinese debt has gone up. Overall, across the advanced economies, uh, debt went up in 2007 to 11, and it hasn't come down. Uh, it's stabilized at a higher level. And meanwhile, emerging country debt uh, in China, in Singapore, in Brazil, ha is now on a strong uh, upward path. And that debt, particularly Chinese debt, has, of course, played a major role in keeping the global economy going post the crisis. I mean, the reason why it occurred was that in 2009, the Chinese authorities were worried about a slowdown of the Chinese economy in response to the global financial crisis. They gave instructions to their banks to, as they put it, open your wallets wide. Uh, the banks indeed did that. They lent lots of money uh, to infrastructure developers, to local government, to state-owned enterprises. And that played a role, a very important role, in keeping the global economy going through the demand for commodities, through the demand uh, for capital goods from the big capital goods producers of the world. But that now creates a major vulnerability. Indeed, I think one of the biggest vulnerabilities uh, in the world economy today is the growth of credit in China. Um, having gone down the path of sustaining uh, the uh, growth in China through an expansion of credit, I think the Chinese are now in a situation where they don't really know how to get off this train. Um, uh, in the first half of this year, we've seen in the first quarter a slowdown in the Chinese economy. There was a lot of commentary about, well, China needed to do that, move to a, a more balanced growth model, less dependent on infrastructure and real estate investment, uh, less credit intensive. Uh, and then in the second quarter, it was quite clear that the authorities began to worry about that. And what did they do? Well, they reached for the lever they've always uh, reached for, which is more credit. They said they were doing it in a targeted fashion uh, this time round, with targeted relending, targeted reduction in reserve requirements. But the net effect is the same. It's been a re-stimulus of uh, the credit cycle. And so there are major problems about the Chinese economy uh, as to whether they know how to get off uh, this uh, credit-based growth. And it's not clear that they do. And there is a real danger that the, if they cannot find a way out of that, that China in five years' time will be the source of the next major financial crisis. I'm very wary of the idea that trade uh, negotiations, trade deals, are going to be the saviors of the global uh, economy. Uh, there's a lot of talk at the moment about the fact that despite the fact that we've had a recovery since 2008, even though it's been a weak one in terms of GDP growth, trade growth has been even slower. And so we have the phenomenon of trade growing slower than GDP compared with many decades before where trade used to grow at, people used to use a rule of thumb of it would grow at twice the rate of GDP. And people say, well, does that mean that the globalization uh, um, you know, driver of growth has been switched off, is it due to protectionism, etc. I'm wary of that belief. I think there may be some fundamental factors uh, at work uh, which are tending, uh, may tend in future, to take us into an environment in which trade will grow uh, less than GDP. I think as societies get richer, uh, they tend to spend uh, an increasing percentage of consumption on some consumption goods and services which are inherently local, like health services or restaurants rather than things that can be exported. I think that as China's uh, real wages increase, some of its competitive advantage versus uh, US manufacturing will decline. And equally, I think we may well be on the verge 
of a major wave of automation and robotization where some manufacturing jobs will return, or some manufacturing output will return to the major developed economies, but without many jobs, jobs and manufacturing activity in a very job-like fashion. I think those may, be, those may be factors at work which help explain this phenomenon of trade growth slower than GDP growth, and that those are natural phenomenon that we shouldn't worry about. As for the trade liberalization agenda, I think it's valuable to try and do more trade liberalization, but I do think we have to realize that we are infilling the final steps of trade liberalization. I mean, tariffs on industrial products were reduced dramatically between the 1940s and the 1990s. It just follows automatically that the final steps of eliminating them cannot possibly make the as much difference as the earlier, uh, you know, GATT uh, and WTO were rounds made to uh, the global economy. So I think we sometimes have an institutional inertia. I mean, we have a lot of people who have devoted their lives to the very good and useful activity of trade negotiation and trade liberalization, who will have a natural bias to believe that yet more of that is the fundamental thing that drives the real, uh, will drive the global economy. I think it can be useful, but I think it is relatively marginal compared with the big things to do with the demand drag coming from the debt overhang problems uh, that we face. I think that's where the big problems come from the real econo uh, for the global economy, to which we don't have complete answers, but we need to keep thinking about.